Thank you, Martin, and also the other organizers for inviting me to give a talk. I should say that, frankly, I should say that uh, it wasn't a pleasant experience coming down here uh, because of my flight, missing of the flight, and and also, you know, the stress that I have to undergo to be here. But at the end of the day, I'm here and happy to see all of you and also to see Martin and others who I saw them two years ago. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, just uh, a recent work that we started to do with uh, a single cell transcriptomics, uh, specifically focusing on uh, type 2 diabetes. And uh, and the approach that we took to understand this problem. So, because usually when you do a single cell transcriptomic analysis, you will see very traditional approaches being used. Here we try to look at the network and the trajectory inference approaches, which, which is also somewhat standard, is becoming a standard and people have started to use it. But then we want to use it in the situation where we want to understand a, a healthy and a disease condition and specifically focusing on a pancreatic cells. Okay. Uh, just to give you some brief introduction about pancreatic cells, I'm, I'm sure that some of you already know about it, but then just to uh, be on the same page, uh, we know that pancreatic cells can be, of, uh, can be into two classes, which is endocrine cells, which are typically beta, alpha, gamma, delta, and ep epsilon. And exocrine cells are SNR and ductal cells. And we also know that the pancreas is an important organ, which plays a very important role in whole body metabolism specifically in glucose homeostasis. And we also know that the beta cells is one of the major cell type in the pancreas and followed by alpha cells. And then we also know that pancreas is also one of the central organ which is involved in, uh, um, involved in type 2 diabetes, although the peripheral organs also come into picture. But because of its uh, association with the secretion of insulin and how it brings about changes to the blood glucose level. It's one of the central organ which people uh, always uh, put forward as a major, or can you, in the network perspective, you can say it's a central node in the overall glucose homeostasis. And when you talk about glucose uh, level control in blood, we talk about insulin secretion, which will uh, drive the peripheral organs like skeletal muscles, adipose tissue, or liver to uptake glucose and thereby your blood glucose level is maintained, so which is typically an homeostatic processes. And when you talk about type 2 diabetes, we think about it in, uh, you can think in terms of uh, the peripheral organs losing its sensitivity towards insulin. In that process, the pancreas makes more insulin, and, you, and typically a type 2 diabetic patient would have more insulin in his blood along with the blood glucose level being very high. And you can also associate um, uh, type 2 diabetes or the pre-diabetic stage, which is called insulin resistance to some of the changes which happen specifically with respect to the insulin signaling here. And some of the changes could, could be at the level of receptor or some of the changes could be at the level of signaling. Uh, one of our earlier works were mostly focusing on the insulin signaling pathway, how it uh, controls the, uh, uh, the switching between um, uh, activation and inactivation with respect to the glucose level. And we took into consideration how obesity affects the insulin signaling pathway. So, so the idea for the whole talk came from the earlier work, which where we linked the obesity to the insulin signaling pathway, which typically gets uh, connected through, uh, you can talk about the increase in the blood concentration of amino acids, typically the branch chain amino acids, which have an effect on the insulin signaling pathway. So this is how we started to work on this topic. But here in this case, where we are focusing more on uh, a data side, okay, so it's not just simply, it's not hypothesis driven or model driven, but it's mostly the, the part of the talk will be mostly focusing on the data side, so it might be of interest to students who are not even a biologist, but they are good at data analysis, possibly you can ask me a lot of questions, maybe I'm not so expert at that level. Okay, so given that some idea about what happens in pancreatic cells and what are the different types of pancreatic cells, now the question is, uh, how does the earlier work look like? I mean, so most of the work which we we'll, uh, take into consideration, they were done on whole islets. So typically um, uh, in experimental setup, you isolate the whole tissue, and then you go through the sequencing procedure, which will help you to quantify the RNA levels, which is to, called as uh, transcriptomics. And what is the drawback of this approach is that you will end up in getting an average expression levels, right? So you are, you are talking about a bulk tissue. You take a sample from a bulk tissue, 
and you're mixing up multiple cell types. So what happens naturally is that the, uh, the cell type compositions are mixed up. So the, whatever quantification you're doing is an average of all those mixture. And when you want to ask questions like how the cellular heterogeneity in pancreatic cells look like, you cannot get to the point of answering it. Whereas now the new, the single cell transcriptomic um, uh, pipeline have helped in trying to look at the uh, changes which are happening at the individual cells, like alpha, beta, gamma. And you can see that the sequencing, or typically I'm using this word with an impression that at least some of you know that, but the sequencing have helped in quantifying some of the transcriptomic profile of all these individual uh, cells, which are just a cartoon here. And then you can use that information to do some kind of a clustering analysis. So this is uh, like a PC or a TSNE plots you could do. Uh, but the TSNE plots, which is much more uh, nonlinear data reduction methods, which is becoming more popular in this uh, single cell transcriptomic analysis. And you will see some of these plots, which are TSNE plots. So this allows you to ask some specific questions like, is there an heterogeneity within the uh, population of beta cells? Uh, can you identify some subpopulation within the beta cells? Or you can also look at some of these, um, can there be a continuum of states? So you can ask uh, whether a cell starts from uh, some origin and it goes through certain transitions and then it reaches the final state. Can you get that picture also from this kind of data? So given that, uh, this data sets have become available nowadays, so you, it is good that we can go and look at it from a very different perspective and look at whether we can get derive some insights, which would have some implication that could help the experimentalist to do some experiments. So that's the overall um, aim of this work. And so the, the work which I'm going to, or the data that which I'm going to use is coming from this paper, which was published in 2016. And this is one of the largest uh, in terms of uh, largest data set for pancreatic cells. And you can see that uh, it's coming from six healthy and uh, four type 2 D donors. So it's not a, even though the number of sample size in terms of the patients are very few, but you can get a lot of samples from each of these donors. So, the, so when I say sample, it means cell from now on. So a donor will be the referring, I will be referring to these uh, six healthy or four type 2 diabetes patients. And once uh, you isolate these islets, then you can do some kind of analysis like facts or microfluidic methodology to extract those single cells. And then there are multiple protocols nowadays which you can use to create these kind of uh, libraries. And in this paper, you can, uh, it's something like SmartSeq2 protocol was used. I don't know whether it's important to discuss here, but if you are interested, you can have a look at this paper. And then eventually you could do the cell, uh, cell type uh, specific transcriptional profiling. So in that in that process, you can get a kind of say uh, uh, plenty of samples from one donor itself. So in that way, you are not being limited by the number of samples. But then you will see there are drawbacks, which I will discuss when it comes to doing the single cell transcriptomic analysis. So just to give you a summary of the data, I hope it's visible from the back. I mean, is it visible? Okay. So if you look at this, these are the sample uh, IDs, which is a little bit crazy. I should agree, I should uh, agree to that. But then uh, you, these are very much relatable. For example, the condition you can say healthy or type 2 diabetes. And then you also have a gender information, whether it's male or female. And then you also have the body mass index, which is a BMI. And then you have age, and these are the samples. So you can imagine that this is a patient who has donated possibly 73 cells. And these 73 cells need not be, all 73 of them are beta cells. It could be, some of them would be, 10 would be beta cells, 11 be alpha cells. So it's a total number of cells which have been taken from a donor. But it's a cumulative of all cell types or some cell types, okay, is it clear? And what is interesting here is that, uh, given that you have a gender difference, so you have a male and female, you could also look at what happens, whether is there a difference in uh, the behavior of the cells with respect to the gender. You can also look at it from the perspective of the BMI, which is the most important part which we have been talking about, which is the obesity part, which I told you before, where you can say that BMI greater than 30 could be an obese per person. BMI less than 25 could, uh, this is the standard BMI chart which I'm going over it. So the less than 25 would be treated as uh, healthy and uh, hale and healthy. Whereas between 25 to 29, you could think about an overweight person. You are an overweight person. So, so you have a mixture of all. So you have a healthy intermediate BMI and also obese uh, patient here. 
and you also have a difference in age and uh, difference in gender. So this makes it a very interesting data set so that you can, uh, although these are covariates which could uh, affect your results, right? So, but then we want to retain them for uh, the analysis so that we could see whether any age specific or BMI specific or gender specific things are happening in this data set. So this was not done the original data sets which was uh, used which was done previously, where they regressed out all those covariates okay, to do the analysis. But we want to retain and we want to see whether we can bring about any such uh, changes that could come forward. And uh, if you just to show you the kind of results what they've got, so, so that it will, uh, you can compare with what we are, uh, what I'm going to show you. So this is the results from this paper, which they typically I told you about uh, the TSNE plots which is a kind of a PCA plot, where they do a clustering of different cells based on uh, gene expression. So here they have been uh, clustered based on, you can think in terms of, uh, uh, and uh, where they have shown you here the typical uh, different uh, hormones which have been specific for each cell type, which is very well nicely clubbed together in terms of uh, different cell types here. But then there's no cell type identification here, but then they only just show that these hormones are expressed in specific cell type. This is kind of something that they can also show as a proof of concept that the, because in the single cell sequencing protocol, you have to make sure that these cells are really beta cells or alpha cells. So this is one of the way in which you can also do, you can look at the expression patterns of those enzymes and then you can show that this is very unique to those cells. So this is one thing which they showed. The another important interesting part what they showed is that, for example, they took a beta cells and uh, they looked at, say, for example, top 50 highly varying genes and they do a simple uh, clustering based analysis and you see that there is very nicely uh, four clusters you can talk about in a beta cell itself. So you're talking about beta cell population, which is very crucial for insulin secretion. And you can show that there are four different clusters based on the gene expression patterns. So which tells you that this paper claimed that there is a subpopulation of beta cells within or within the, you can talk in terms of uh, differences in donors or it could have differences in age or BMI, but here there's no such differences because they all re been regressed out. Okay, so that's what I want, was highlighting you. The, there's no effect of covariates on these uh, clustering patterns. So it's purely uh, what you see is the subpopulation which is coming from say top 50 or top 100 highly varying genes, which they have shown. So given this as a benchmark for us to look at it, what we were asking is, can we do something very differently from what they have done in the sense of, you know that from the single cell transcriptomic studies, uh, and also we know that the gene expression is very stochastic. Can we try to look at for some stable, you know, stable um, states which would be much more uh, robust in the sense that you can, don't want the things to be changing depending upon the stochastic noise in the gene expression. Or you want to also look at it from the perspective of uh, how can you, you know, rule out some kind of a transcriptional bursting that can occur that could not be, you know, well, uh, that can even affect this clustering pattern. So we want to go into that uh, frame of uh, thought where we want to show that this clustering could be still shown to be robust in that way that we could find some populations of these cell types, but then at much more at a higher level. So this is when we started to think about a network approach to do this. And and this is the, uh, just a framework what uh, Dr. Ganesh was also talking about, but then this is from the level of RNA. So it's not just at the level of proteins, but this is at the level of RNAs where we talk about, uh, and I have to tell you that all the ideas that we are talking about is coming from the bulk uh, tissue gene expression data analysis. So the ideas is not just simply invented for the sake of uh, single cell transcriptomic analysis, but they are all uh, already existing for bulk data analysis that we are just only using it for, or we are taking into consideration certain factors that are there for single cell transcriptomic analysis, but then we are borrowing ideas from what was we've been doing for bulk sequence, bulk uh, tissue sequence analysis. So here what you're looking at is simply a co-expression between two genes, and then you are trying to uh, construct a network, which is uh, you typically can you call it as co-expression network, and then you go on to identify modules, so module deduction, you can use different algorithms to do that. And then once you identify modules, then you could do a lot of analysis where you can say, uh, you can identify the regulatory information of the module. So for example, here we are talking about gene expression. So can we talk about in terms of what are the transcriptional factors that regulate these modules? So that's kind of regulatory information you're adding to it. And then you can also look at the differences in modules between two conditions. So, okay, so you're talking about um, 
healthy and uh, disease state. So you want to look at the differences in module between those two conditions. Then you can also do a typical enrichment analysis, just like uh, what Dr. Ganesh said about it. You can do David or Enrich. Uh, there are many softwares which do geotherm enrichments, biological process enrichment, and all those things. So you can do a lot of uh, uh, get biological insights from doing this. I'll give you an example of what we are talking about. And then you can also find what is a critical node in that uh, hub, hub gene in that module, which is very important. And then it's also a very interesting thing, which is called guilt by association predictions, where you can, if there is a gene which for which you don't know any function or you don't know any uh, related function with a disorder or a, any normal condition, by clustering together with the known genes, you are able to attribute some function to it. So it's a kind of vague, but still uh, have a lot of value in doing all these kinds of analysis. But then. Uh, typically, this kind of analysis, which we borrowed from the bulk sequence analysis, we could also use it in single transcriptomic analysis and see what happens. Just to give you a glimpse of what you have been doing with bulk sequencing data, and then you, you are also asking the question in the other way around. So we want to see how can we use the bulk sequencing uh, data and then derive cell type specific changes. So because all these days we talk about single cell uh, transcriptomic changes, but then all the data which is currently available, the most of the data which has been available is all coming from a bulk tissue. So how to get information about cell type composition or cell type proportion from those bulk tissue? So can we go at that level and can we ask information from the other side also? So we have done a just a analysis of it. I will show you the results. So this is a just an analysis where we have done for uh, aging and AD disorder, so where we have created a network of young, aging, and AD. So we have created a kind of a, like a progression network, but then you can think in terms of the dynamics is much more like on a longer time scale because you're talking about age from 25 to 90 years old, right? So it's a kind of a long uh, you know, age gap. So we created this network, and then we did the same analysis what we are talking about here, like creating network. We detect the modules, okay? And then you can look at the different modules, what are the co corresponding biological process which are associated with it, and then can we co go back and ask what are the relationship with aging? So you can correlate those modules to the aging, you can correlate the modules to also to the AD, so ADs can be quantified by some of these cores, which are quantifying the AD plagues or uh, deposition of NFT or uh, amyloids, right? So those cores are there, so you can correlate with them and get some kind of a disease-specific module, aging-specific modules, or there's a progression module, so where you can say that it goes from young, aging to AD. So there are some, you can put it in three buckets and then you can get a very uh, good insights from these aspects. But then what I just wanted to highlight is that although we identified these modules, but we went on to show that these modules are not just simply uh, a collection of biological process, but they're also having some association with the cell types of the brain. So if you, in this, in this table, if you look at it, so we can look at it from uh, different cell types in the brains, like astrocytes, endothelial, microglial, neurons, and oligodendroid sites. And these are the modules which were identified from the network analysis. Okay, so and then what we are trying to do is it's tr simply trying to look at the module overlap with an existing gene signature. So all these things, astrocytes and endothelial cells have been, um, gene signatures have been identified, and this comes from the single cell knowledge. Okay, the single cell transcriptomic analysis also gives you, in that way, helping you in the bulk sequencing analysis where the gene signatures could also be clearly you know, detected. And that can be used for enrichments of these modules. So you can enrich those modules to find out whether these modules are uh, associated with specific cell types. And what is interestingly we found is that certain modules are very cleanly associated. For example, microglial module, which is the immune cell system, what we are talking about, is associated with one of these modules. And then you can see that there are modules which are very specifically to the neurons, and there are modules which are mixture, where you can see it's an astrocyte and endothelial cells. And this, this is where the problem starts, where you cannot clearly pinpoint where which cell type it belongs to. But then at least we have some idea about what, what are the modules this uh, cell type composition belongs to. And you can also talk about uh, difference in terms of how these modules or the cell type composition changes as you progress along from young to age, uh, aging to AD. So this is also an interesting. So once you know that these modules belong to microglial or neuron or its oligodendrocytes, you can now ask the question, what happens to these modules? How do they change from young to disease, right? So in that sense, what you'll know that, for example, in aging, you will see that microglial modules will come up. 
Whereas in the AD, you'll see the neuronal modules will come up together with microglial modules. So in that sense, you can make a very impactful kind of predictions, which will say that some kind of a network level understanding of the whole process, which is purely coming from the bulk sequencing data analysis, using some knowledge of single cell transcriptomics, which in terms of enriching themselves. And now, currently, there are a lot of challenges which are going on, which would have been interest to you. I mean, possibly the dream challenges, recent dream challenges, tries to look at how can you use this, um, the bulk sequencing data, and then can you get the single cell composition from it. So there are one dream channel challenge which is going on which uses typically dif uh, different techniques like deconvolution techniques, which comes from computer vision or NLP that you can use, that you can try to come up with new algorithms to do that. Here we have used a very simple uh, uh, kind of uh, two nominal variable comparison where you can say, I want to look at the labels of those uh, genes compared with the labels of the genes in the module. So in that way, we have come up with this kind of enrichment, but you can come up with fancy techniques and better techniques for this, doing this. Okay, so this is just another one example where I said from the bulk side, bulk tissue sequencing side, but then going on to the single cell sequencing side, um, analysis. So we, we were looking about what kind of analysis that we can do for this. Uh, then we came across this paper, which was reported in 2017, which was nicely fitting along the direction in which we were going around. And, but then this comes with a little bit of uh, differences to what I told you in terms of how they do this uh, uh, the co-expression, if I go back to this step, so how do they construct the network? So there you can bring about a lot of differences to your own way of doing it. You can start from simple co-expression network to simple, uh, you can create uh, probabilistic uh, graphical models or you can create mutual information-based models. So uh, the, the differences could come at that level where you, how do you do that? And you'll also see that there are also some, so you will see that when you want to create a co-expression network, so here you can uh, uh, random forest base. So they converted this problem into a kind of ML, machine learning kind of problem here. It uh, follows a random forest based approach, which here they are treating this whole problem as uh, um, a kind of a, a regression problem, which is you are trying to predict the target gene expression using other genes as an input. Right? So it's basically a regression problem that they've broken down, and then they are also trying to see that how they can do it in a, with minimal effort, right? In that sense, they use this tree-based ensemble approach to do this. So the random forest-based approach is just, you are trying to treat this co-expression network as a, a kind of a, a supervised learning approach where you, you have come across, for example, you want to select a set of features which best predicts the output, right? So that's in this way, in this way you're saying that I want to predict or I want to predict the set of features that will tar predict the target gene expression. So that is what has been done in this random forest-based approach. And, but then in this approach, what you will find that you will find all the genes which shows very pattern, very similar, right? So there could be a lot of false positive in this case. So to get away from that, they include the cis regulatory uh, motif analysis, which is typical bioinformatic analysis, what you will do, where you can identify the transcriptional uh, factor binding site. So in, if you take a module which is identified as part of this co-expression network, and then you can look at all the targets and all the genes, their promoter, and look at whether the, there's a motif which is enriched in those modules. In that process, you will be able to eliminate certain genes which don't have these kind of motif. Uh, motif. So in that process, you are retaining only the ones which are known to be a transcriptional activator that will be activating its target. So in that, so this comes from the knowledge of uh, prior knowledge. So here you're using a prior knowledge, which is coming from a database where you can say a transcriptional factor and its known targets are well known. So in that, is, in that sense, you can, you're using a prior knowledge to eliminate some of these false positives which can come. And then there is a very nice, uh, you know, once you identify these modules, then you can score those modules. So in that sense, you can, um, uh, follow a certain typical approach that you could come across in ML. So you can see that, I don't know whether you can see this, but then uh, what has been done here is that they, it's very similar to what I told you in terms of enriching the module for uh, cell type specific genes. So, so here what they're doing is, once you identify these reglon, uh, what we call a reglon here is a transcriptional factor and its target. So, so this is the terminology which I'm using here, okay? So once, uh, once you identify from this steps the transcriptional factor and its targets, now you want to see that, can I score this reglon? So what, what is happening here is, so, 
So you're having transcriptional factors with certain genes which are there. Right? So you, similarly, you can have similarly another modules which are like, keeps going on, growing. Okay. So now we want to score each of them okay. in terms of some activity based on the expression values of those genes. So they follow what is that typically they, what they're using is the area under the curve of the recovery curve. And um, if you want to understand that, so what they are trying to do is that you take each of these cells, right? And then what they're trying to do is for each of these cells, there are a set of gene ex expressions and they can rank those gene expression based on its level. And then now comparing that gene expression level, say top 10, top 20, top 30, top 40 percent, with the, the reglons, whether these genes are on the top 10 or top 20 or top 30, in that process you are trying to compute the area under the curve. So this is the area under the curve that value has been used for quantification of the reglon activity. Is it clear? Or if it's not clear, I can tell you how it has been done, okay? But then you can assume that these reglons have been quantified by using this area under the curve. And once you quantify that, then there's a difficulty, the, the, the problem becomes a little bit more difficult to choose a threshold for control, saying that the reglon is active or inactive, right? So that is the problem here. So you can see here in this case, when the distribution is bimodal, it's very easy. You can take it as an inflection point, as a point of the threshold. But if it's not bimodal, but then it's simply a normal distribution, then you are in trouble. Okay, so then you have to have a set of other mixture distribution to understand this. And then you have to use some kind of manual manipulations to see or don't report those kind of results. So you report those results which are very clear. So in this paper, what we have done is we have only reported those ones which shows bimodal distributions, okay? So we haven't, uh, we eliminated those ones which we are not sure about it. So because we don't want to simply claim and then later on it turn out to be simply because of the methodology or because of the threshold that we get, get into a new set of uh, reglons. So is it clear? Is it clear or do you, do you want me to explain a little bit more? So this part, if you are uh, not, Understood, uh, you have not understood, I can tell you after the talk, okay? So, but then you, once you score the reglon activity, then now for each cell, you have, say, hundreds of reglons which are active or inactive, and use that information to do the clustering. So the whole idea of me doing this simply not just simply using the gene expression to the cluster, to do the clustering, that's what the original paper does, yeah. Uh, so, is, no, I didn't get it. So you, you can get these kind of things, okay. So this kind of, so when you talk about, so this TA will be part of this reglon also. It could be there. Yeah, it's there. Yeah, it will be there. I just made it very uh, black and white. But then all kinds of possibility exist here. But yeah, so, the, but it's a very nice way of scoring. So once you score that, then you have for each cell, uh, uh, value which can attribute to each reglon. So you can say 100 reglons are there, and you can say whether a reglon is active or inactive for each of these cells. And now use that information for clustering. So are these like five clusters or these are like multi-clusters? What are you talking about? These are like transcription and gene kind of target. Yes, so each of these, when you talk about reglons, I'm saying transcriptional factor and its targets. So you can have 100 transcriptional factors and all its targets can be clubbed into different, different reglons. So these are like, you can have 100 clusters. And, huh? mm, yes, it could be possible. I mean, that possibility exists because you can have a transcription factor transcribing a gene, which could also be. Yes, yes, because this, this information, what we are talking about, this regulatory motif analysis, is depending upon the prior knowledge. You know the target, you know the transcription factor. So in that way, you, are, uh, you can be very safely saying uh, all those things what I'm trying to say. It's not depending upon inferred. So this part is a very inferred part, where you are inferring the regulatory network, but then this part will filter out those uh, false positives and will gives you a very clear picture of uh, only the real, uh, the prior knowledge information here. So once you have this information, then you go on to do this clustering. So this is what we uh, did in a different way from what the other original paper does. So you can use the reglon activity in each of these cells and do a clustering. And what you could see, I mean, I know that these labels are very crappy here, but then I help you with what are those labels are. So if you look at these uh, two very dominant clusters, which are, you can say here, this is endocrine cluster, 
and these are exocrine clusters. And there are some cell types which are rare cell types in pancreas, like MHSC2 molecule, uh, containing MHSC2 molecule cell types, and there are endothelial cells, which are not many in number. So you will see that, but those clusters are coming here. So it's an intermediate, you can think about as an intermediate cluster, but then you have a predominantly an endocrine and exocrine clusters. And what you are also seeing is that, uh, so this is a beta cell. I just help you out, what are these? These are beta cells. And these are all alpha cells. And then there are also ductal cells here, which are also the endocrine cells, which is clearly visible. But then you can see here also there are two group of uh, ACNR and, um, sorry, ductal cells, which are, which are exocrine. So here, which is delta cell, which are, oh, it's, because it's starting with D, it's becoming a little bit messy here. So it's a delta cells here, which are endocrine cells, but whereas these are ACNR and ductal cells. And this shows simply the, uh, cell density plot. So you can see where the most cells are sitting here. So you can see here it is uh, the, uh, the, you talk about the alpha cells, you can have a clearly two states here, kind of uh, states here. Similarly, you take uh, two uh, beta cells, you have a two different, uh, some kind of a two different cell states here, which is like a two subpopulation here. And similarly, if you take uh, gamma cells, uh, ductal cells, you could see that clearly there are two different, uh, very nice two uh, um, states where most cells are. So it's a kind of a cell density plot. And the bottom half shows you, is just to show you that because the analysis was done without, as I mentioned, it's not, we haven't regressed out any of these uh, BMI differences or age differences. Yeah. Yeah, so here all patients, all patient cells are going in. Yeah, so this is what has been, but it's not shown in that sense. What is shown here is in the bottom half, we are showing the uh, phenotypic differences between those individuals, but the, between the donors. So for example here, uh, this plot, as, as I mentioned, was that it was done in a very unsupervised way without Here. Yeah. No, it doesn't belong to one patient. It doesn't belong. So because this is just an unsupervised analysis, we don't have any kind of donor-based uh, uh, quantification here. But just simply showing that you can find uh, some subpopulation or substate within the group of cells. But just to show that you, that no, because this subpopulation can be influenced by these covariates, just we plotted the BMI and also we plotted the healthy and type 2 T conditions onto this. Just to highlight the clustering is not influenced by them. So you can see that, for example, in alpha cells, you see that type 2 diabetes is scattered everywhere. This, and you'll also see that the high BMI patients are are also scattered everywhere. So it's not just simply this clustering what you're seeing. And similarly, you will see that the beta cells here and here, right, what you're talking about, is not so much influenced by the type 2 diabetes uh, situation here. So in that sense, you can, to some extent, you can say that it's not very much uh, phenotypically uh, driven. But you also see that we also show that uh, whether the male-female differences emerges here. So we can see that both the male and female patients sit in these two clusters. It's not that it's uh, one cluster is male and another cluster is female. It's not due to that. And similarly, you can look at the age also, the age differences also. You can say some effect of age here, but then still you can see that some cells of the high age group or low age group sits in both of these clusters. It's not that purely driven by the phenotypic variability, but then you could see that uh, where does those variability go? And it's well known that when you look at it from the network perspective, some of these covariates are uh, mashed out. So in that sense, you could say this is kind of a batch correction which is happening in this data set. So you don't have to really do a batch correction of the data sets or regress out all those before you start the analysis here yeah, because you're adopting a network approach. You are indirectly, you're smashing out all those uh, covariates which could come into creep into your analysis. And it also, you can see that uh, this, this Reglon-centric approach is somewhat a little bit, I don't want to claim it is robust, but in that sense of, you can think about it, the activity of the Reglon is influenced by all its partners. It's not just simply one gene which has been quantified here but it's a group of genes activity has been quantified. So in that sense, you think that this will not change depending upon the, if you do some other day, some other sequencing, right? So it doesn't matter, but it matters. What it matters is that Reglon activity is what it is driven by the set of genes that are part of this clusters. Okay, so that's, that's another advantage of doing this. So, but then you see that we did not get any knowledge about 
what is the effect of type 2 diabetes, what is an effect of uh, gender or what is an effect of age, all on this plot, right? It's simply, it tells you that there are, it's possible that you can get multiple clusters of each cell type, but then it doesn't give you any idea about type 2 diabetes or any of these things, what we wanted to look at. Okay, so this is just simply to show you. No, it's just, um, it, it, it's not condition specific. It just gives you an idea about all the transcriptional factor and its known targets. And it could come from different cell type. Huh? Okay. No, but uh, here what we are trying to do is we are uh, going with the whole network, right? But the network gets scored based on the expression values. And the expression values reflect those conditions, okay? So we are not just simply starting with a reduced network, right? We are starting with the whole network, and the network is scored based on the actual expression values. In that sense, the uh, the condition that is if it's um, male or female or whatever condition that gets if it is there it will come there but it does it looks like it is not coming there in this analysis you don't see those kind of effects coming in because you are looking at much more bigger than just simply so you could have male specific gene expression sexually dimorphic changes that could happen but here it's not been reflected because you're looking at multiple in a bigger network perspective so it could be possible that gene expression could be different that's what we'll go at the second part of my talk okay so here, just to show you the individual Reglon activities, just so there you are looking at all Reglons to put together for a clustering. So here, just to show you the differences, so you can see that these are Reglons, and whatever you see in the bracket are the genes in that Reglon, okay? And you see that you can see that some of them are like uh, endocrine-specific, some of them are exocrine-specific. So this is exocrine, and this is endocrine. And what you're also seeing that some of them are specifically uh, beta cell-specific, okay? So that, that's also one thing you can see. but. And what you also see is that uh, some of them are very nicely fitting, and this were a lot was derived when you do the analysis on simple gene expression base, where you could see that some of these uh, uh, some of these reglons are also like, for example, coming part of the pancreas development itself. So you could say that, for example, they suppress the endocrine developmental program, whereas the other one suppresses exocrine developmental program. This gets clearly highlighted in your analysis, and that's what, for example, the rest is one of the repressor of endocrine program. It's getting active in exocrine cells, which suppresses the endocrine program in exocrine cells. So in these kind of things are very nicely captured in this kind of analysis. Okay, and it's just uh, now that you have this information, you can now pull out all the reglons which are specific for each of these cell types, and then you can also say which are the reglons which are common across cell types. So these are like a valuable information that could, one could use. And just to summarize that uh, we can for this part of the talk, we can say it's um, and distinguish endocrine and exocrine cells. It's a bird's eye view of what I'm trying to say. And some of these reglons were not reported previously. So whatever I'm saying is possibly needs experimental validation. And if you ask me how to validate these things is a, another big thing, right? Because it's not just single gene knockout, right? Because you're talking about reglon and how, do you, how can you disturb a reglon? That's, uh, so you have to think about transcriptional factor and all this. It's a kind of complicated experiments that you have to plan to do this. And also that I mentioned that some of these identified reglons very nicely fit into the pancreas development. And then this is a very interesting part, which also is very consistent with what has been reported in the literature. So it's not just simply, uh, it, it, it gets validated in that way. Some, already some information are there in terms of uh, multiple cell state being reported, also in experimental situations. So here you will see that you could see alpha cell, beta cell, and ductal cells. These were the observations that we could get from there. And the last one was that this is the one which was really interesting for us in the sense that we couldn't see much of the effect of all those gender or age or um, BMI in this analysis. What we saw was very clear uh, differences. So what we see is that the cell type differences is predominant here than the uh, phenotypic differences. So this effect clearly uh, dominated the whole uh, analysis. So we wanted to look at what could be the way in which we could think about this uh, phenotypic differences which could also talk about the inter-heterogeneity or also intra-heterogeneity in, in the sense that if you take a donor, is there a differences in the 
a beta cells within that donor itself. Or you can think in terms of, as you were saying, between the donors, if there could be differences in the beta cells. So can we look at that level of differences between, say, healthy and type 2 diabetes? So this brings me to the next part of my talk. So where we want to map this uh, inter and intra individual variability in each pancreatic cells. So where here, this is where we, we try to look at it in a very different way in the sense that uh, um, what are the approaches that exist for single cell transcriptomic analysis? And there are one popular approach we could come across is, is called single cell trajectory in pseudo time. And uh, this analysis is very much done for a kind of a developmental trajectory. So you infer uh, where the time axis is running in some pseudo time axis is running, where you can say you start from this branch, you could go on to, it's like a typical Waddington landscape where you, a ball is rolling and you can bifurcate into two different landscape, right? So that's a kind of uh, picture this uh, talks about. So you can get into developmental A, development A or development B, depending upon uh, the transcriptional program of this branch, okay? So this is the, uh, kind of framework that we were having in this mind, but then this is mostly applied for, say, tracing the developmental program. So you want to start from, a, uh, say, a stem cells, and then you want to see how it uh, um, becomes a different cell fate, right? So that's more on that side. And also you can say lineage tracing. These are the approaches that have been used for single cell. But we want to use it for understanding our problem. So in that sense, we want to look at, can we just say, understand the gender-specific differences, or can we understand the uh, differences in BMI, can we also look at at the age level? So all these things we should be go and ask this question using this framework. And to some extent we were able to show that in that way. So what, what was the approach that we took was, is called uh, single cell trajectory construction, which is an approach that was published in Nature Methods. This is another paper in the same year came out. And this also works in a very, uh, very nice way in that sense of uh, you can think about different, so now if you ask me how many methods exist for this kind of uh, pseudo time trajectory construction, I could say easily pinpoint and say it's 50 different methods exist. And the difference is, comes from the knowledge transfer from say typical computer science to here, uh, typical ML machine learning approaches being transferred to learn the processes which are happening in biology. So this is how the field is evolving at least in this area where you can see at least 50 different methods are applied here. But then we are, we are sticking to a very popular method, which is called monocole here. And this method is uh, working here from that perspective of, say, you have a data set, which is uh, here, in this case, each of them represents a cell here. And then you do a principal component, so do a dimension reduction. And then you are using this, what is called, a, what is called a reverse graph embedding. So where you are a principal graph is learned through the centroids in this data. So in that sense, you are trying to fit a data to a graph a principal graph which will pass through the centroids within this data. And then once you fit that, then you start moving these cells to those uh, trajectory. And then you recalculate those centroids. And then you try to project onto the higher dimension to just see how the, uh, now the composition looks like. So you're going through this cycle of uh, 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 repetitive iterations where until you see that the cell states and the trajectory are stable. So you keep on trying to, you're trying to fit the data points to this trajectory, what we are talking about. But this trajectory could be in a very high dimensional space also. So, and you are, once you have a convergence where this is a typical optimization problem you're solving, you are, now you are having a trajectory which I showed you as a cartoon image where you can start from an origin and then you bifurcate into two cell fate. So you can select a node, a node as a root node where you can say this is a star, starting point where I'm going to start from. And then you go on a time axis runs, which is called the pseudo time. So you're starting from here. And if I start reading from here, then you could say that there is a, uh, there is a changes as you walk along that branch. So that's what it means. And then you can see that this is the point of branching, which will give you an idea about um, this difference in cell fate. So this is, this is the overall picture, which uh, summarizes nicely the methodology, but then it works with a very nice uh, reverse graph embedding method, which is well-known popular method. And we applied this onto the data sets to see is there anything that we can find. And what we found was very interesting in that sense. So uh, you'll see that this is constructed for each of these cells and beta, alpha, and uh, gamma, and delta cells. And each of them are colored based on, now we are going into the coloring of the donors. So earlier we didn't color it specifically on the donor differences, but now we are coloring it to just to see uh, anything that we can attribute towards the um, uh, donor specific differences. So you'll see that in the beta cells, you can see that these, these branches mostly dominated by cells coming from low BMI 
uh, uh, low BMI donors. Whereas if you see that this branch is dominated by high BMI donors, T2D donors, and here this branch is dominated by simply high BMI T2D donors. So we would be able to, we were able to just clearly uh, get some kind of an idea about how does, how can you split the cells based on simply the um, uh, based on the gene expression. So here for this analysis, we are not using the regulatory Reglon activity here, but what we are using here is that the donor specific differences in the gene expression. So we are now going back to the gene expression based analysis because now at the network level, we couldn't get a clear picture about uh, how the donor specific differences are there. But then at the level of gene expression, you could easily construct this kind of trajectories which clearly showed that the low BMI branch bifurcates into high BMI and high BMI T2D branch. So this two nicely came out. And you can see that what, you, what, what is interesting here is that this branch contains also low BMI T2D. Uh, so this is a condition which is very challenging condition where you say a person suffers from T2D, but he is not obese. Okay. So how do we look at those kind of patients and how you differentiate that patient from the high BMI T2D patient, right? So here you see that in beta cells, this T2D, the low BMI T2D and low BMI are mixing together. So which means that it says that the low BMI T2D is not having a big problems with beta cells. But if you go to alpha cells, it becomes very much obvious, right? So if you look at low BMI here, but low BMI has low BMI samples, uh, donor cells here. But then you see that there is a some kind of differences that emerges at the level of alpha cells for the low BMI T2D. Is it clear? And similarly, you see that there is a very nice branching which shows that it's a high BMI T2D donors here, and then there is a high BMI uh, sample donors here. So which, which tells you that there is some kind of a pattern which you could look at it, and what is why this branching pattern is working? Because you have variability within the cells, within the donor. That's the only reason why this is working. If you don't have a variability within the donor, then you this kind of trajectory wouldn't be working. Also, you have donors with high variability. So th that's the only reason why we were able to show this. Otherwise, it wouldn't be like, so where we can say that some kind of continuum is happening here, where the cells are starting from a low BMI, which is a healthy state, and then you are moving closely, slowly, slowly, slowly to a node which is bifurcating. And if you are high BMI, and if you're not T2D, you're going into this branch, but then if you're high BMI T2D, you're going into this branch. So you can think in terms of continuum of states, and you're passing from one state to the other state. So that's what is happening here. And similarly, if you look at here, at the gamma cell, it's a very interesting phenomenon. You see that the low BMI splits into low BMI T2D and high BMI T2D. So which means that there is uh, there is no uh, no such differences in terms of low BMI or high BMI, high BMI or high BMI T2D here. So it looks like both these samples are sitting together. Yeah, but it clearly says that the low BMI T2D has some effect on gamma cells. So that's another factor that you can pick from here. Whereas if you look at the delta cell, it's complete disaster here in terms of because if you look in terms of number of cells that we got from some of these donors are very low. So in that sense, you will see that these two branches are low BMI branches, and these two, which is branching out, uh, seems to be high BMI branches. But then you will see that the number of samples which comes here is very low in the sense that we couldn't get. So in this algorithm, you can modify parameters, you can play with parameters, and you can still see whether this is robust, right? The results could, whether it could be robust or not is another question, right? Whether if I change the parameter, all the branching pattern falls apart, right? That should not happen, right? So we have to try out. And reasonably, we could get a branching pattern which was robust for a certain range of parameters. So that's uh, another thing what we tried with this uh, once the reviewer was asking about it. And then we were trying to look at whether this is influencing the whole thing. Uh, but then you can clearly cannot say much about from the delta cell. So we, but then we were happy about that the low BMI results were very clearly coming out. And then what you're also seeing here in gamma cells, I want to highlight a few things here, is that the, if you look at some of these um, samples here, these samples is, are really, uh, you can think in terms of whether there's a gender-specific differences or not, but I couldn't locate which one belongs to which sample. <laughs> I'm sorry about it. I have to go back to the table to say which is uh, gender difference uh, in terms of which is male and female here. But then there, we could find out some kind of differences in terms of male or female with respect to gamma cells. So that's what I just wanted to highlight. OK, so this is just to give you, uh, based on this plot, you could also look at uh, what are the genes which are changing along this branch, right? So two minutes, OK. So what are the genes which are changing along this branch? So we could look at it in that sense of uh, plot those genes and see what is the uh, interesting genes that are going to change. You will see that. 
these are the branching points of those two um, points what we are talking about. So you will start from uh, one, st one state uh, origin and then you go on to bifurcate into say high BMI healthy and high BMI T2D. So you can get two different states. And what is interesting in this plot is that, you, I just highlight this and move on, is that the, this is an insulin. Okay, and what you're seeing here is that when you are in, the, in a low BMI situation, your insulin concentration is, um, insulin levels are here, but then as you are, this is a, some kind of a pseudo time, this is what I was trying to picturize the whole developmental problem as a uh, time problem in progression from healthy to disease, right? So that's what it is. You can see here as time progresses, uh, pseudo time progresses, you can see that the insulin concentration is rising, right? But then after a certain time, you'll see that in type 2 diabetes, insulin concentration dips. Whereas in high BMI T2D, the insulin concentration stays there. So you can see that there's some kind of adaptation is going on here. But that happens in high BMI condition, but in high BMI T2D, it doesn't happen. And similarly, you see this is another important uh, uh, protein, which is a negative regulator of insulin. And you'll see that this concentration of this negative regulator is going, on, going down, which is suggesting that it's becoming the insulin sensitivity to the insulin is increasing. It's because it's a negative regulator. It's a P10, which is a phosphatase, which can inhibit insulin signaling. And you see that its concentration is decreasing. But then if you see that in a high BMI condition or a high BMI T2D condition, it starts to increase. So that's a very interesting adaptation that is going on in high BMI T2D, high BMI condition, but not in high BMI T2D. So this, this kind of inferences that we can derive out of such analysis could be of useful. Okay, so just quickly to wrap it up. So we could do this in, say, Asinar and ductal cells, but I just wanted to highlight few important things and then I move on here is that what you see here is in acinar and ductal cells, we clearly saw differences in terms of male and female. That's what I just wanted to highlight in, in the sense that you will see that this high BMI T2D patients, uh, female was mixing up with high BMI. It was never being separated out. So which told us something is very different in acinar and ductal cells. So that's one, one information we derived out of it. And that's what we just wanted to highlight. Okay, so just to summarize from this part of the analysis, what we did was we tried to look at the cell type specific changes. And we also looked at what are the changes which are common across all these cell types and what are unique. In that process, we identified some of these biological processes which could be different. And we also we found certain things which are very gender specific. So that's what we, I wanted to highlight. And we also wanted to talk about, and also, what we observed was we found a lot of cell-to-cell -cell variability. In that sense, it's not just because we had a lot of samples, because beta cell also was the number of beta cells were more than were exocrine cells. But then we found a lot of variability in acinar and uh, uh, ductal cells. Okay, so I wind up my talk, and I have to give credit to the student who did all the thesis work on this topic, and my group and my funding. Thank you so much for your patient listening. <laughs>